Okay, thank you, Hitoshi, for the invitation to, to come to do this uh, conversation. Um, we, Sylvia and I have had some previous uh, communication about, uh, about it, uh, so it's, it's not a kind of uh, new, entirely new theme for, for either of us. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in fact, we have even had some, some feedback uh, before. And so the, the, the thing that I'm going to be presenting uh, more as a, as a series of ideas that I've been uh, thinking uh, on for, for a while uh, than, than concrete uh, proposals uh, is uh, this idea of uh, no frills uh, uh, or, or, or cheapness and, and democracy, which, which, is, uh, <clears throat> which is something that I, I uh, started thinking about a few years uh, back. The, the, I'm not going to show an, any of my, my work uh, because I think it's, uh, it's something that uh, is not I don't know yet how to bring this uh, this um, discussion into into work, uh, and I think that's probably why I'm I'm interested in in posing it as a as a subject of uh, of discussion. <coughs> uh, but but the, the the first idea that I started considering this um, this uh, issue of uh, cheapness was. Uh, while uh, looking at things like like this, uh, this is actually pictures that I that I took a couple of weeks ago in in Istanbul, which is one of the many cities in the world that uh, are growing uh, urban topographies of this nature. This is no longer Istanbul. This is, <coughs> I think, Seoul, and this is some other Korean city. Uh, and, and more Korean cities. So, so I mean, uh, suddenly you, you, you travel around and you see how uh, the contemporary city, this is Dubai, this is, I don't know, Jakarta or, or one of these places in the, in the Far East. Oops. So, uh, <laughs> so basically, uh, the, the, the idea, I, I started thinking about this uh, uh, a few years ago. Uh, because you see this incredible amount of people and construction landing in, in, uh, into cities, cities uh, growing uh, exponentially in a, in a form that is, uh, is far from, uh, perhaps, fra far from what we understand as, uh, as uh, a city, as a place where uh, there is a collective of <clears throat> of people sharing space and probably also sharing the, the, the type of decisions that, uh, that rule uh, the life in, in those uh, territories. Uh, and yet, I mean, you, you look at things like this in, in, in Istanbul, and they have a certain quality. And when you, when you, are, when you are around uh, <clears throat> there, you realize also that the people who are moving into these uh, flats, that are flats for the uh, new emerging middle classes, there is a, a, a very strong desire on the part of the people there to acquire a city, acquire uh, an architecture that is actually uh, interesting. Uh, there, is a, there, is, there is interest in design. That you can see them also uh, being interested in, in design because they shop uh, certain uh, items in the <clears throat> in the shopping malls. You see certain brands uh, that uh, you didn't expect uh, to be in emerging economies uh, present there and, and and appreciated by the uh, by the public. And, and so I thought that if we were able to understand why um, how to how to exploit the 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 potential that exists in this in this type of urban growths, um, <clears throat> architecturally and urbanistically, we, we could uh, probably uh, make incredible transformations of, of, uh, of, um, of the, the cities as they are uh, growing now. Uh, and, and so I, I became 
interested in in that uh, problem in 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 how to penetrate this market which is a market basically of cheap uh, urban topographies cheap architectures um, perhaps as a, as a field of potential uh, let, let's uh, let's say and and all this uh, also was uh, was related with with uh, the consideration of <coughs> of uh, other other um, problems that I I was uh, interested in the last few years which which uh, had to do with the possible uh, retrieval uh, within the practice of architecture of uh, some sort of uh, political agency, which is something that uh, if you practice as, a, as an architect today, you, you realize, and if you, if you see who, da, who do these, uh, these buildings that I was uh, uh, just showing, you, you realize that architects have been uh, slowly moved out of any position of uh, power uh, in terms of how uh, those cities uh, grow and, and how those cities are uh, implemented. <coughs> So I started looking at, uh, simultaneously, as I was also looking at this kind of topographies of uh, cheapness, as uh, I started looking at uh, the people who had made, uh, shaped the, the, the contemporary political uh, discourse, or the, the political discourse, not, not so much contemporary, but at the end of the, of the 20th century, and found out that, the, I mean, this is not an exhaustive uh, research, but some of these individuals uh, had uh, uh, tried, had addressed certain political fields uh, and um, turned them or, or uh, proposed the, the, uh, the idea of equalization within those fields as, uh, as the type of politics that shaped uh, the, the end of the 20th century, uh, for better or worse. And then uh, I, um, and then I, I look at the, uh, the another type of people, uh, people that, without any political office or uh, any political ideology, from uh, or at least not declared political ideology, uh, had made I think uh, crucial changes in the way in which we live in the way in which politics unfold, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And in those people who, who, who I mean, again, these are just uh, a few of, uh, of them, had replaced the idea of um, equality by the idea of cheapness, which is probably something uh, quite uh, evident if, if you think that maybe the other, the, the kind of uh, political visionaries were uh, operating in, a, in the field of uh, ideology and these people are operating in the, in the market. No? So uh, in the market, equality is cheapness or uh, availability of uh, goods, affordability of, of goods, that, that uh, possibility of, uh, of uh, providing services or products to a wider majority, you can see it uh, perhaps as some sort of uh, democratic um, endeavor. Uh, and so I, I thought that it was interesting to try to understand how they operate, because if, uh, uh, if uh, architects uh, understood how these people uh, operate uh, and turn uh, a product, being money or being clothes or furniture, uh, and, and how by producing a product in a certain way, they are able to produce uh, substantial uh, social and political uh, changes, uh, perhaps that would be an opportunity for uh, architects to retrieve uh, some of that lost um, capacity uh, to, to transform those realities that, that I was now interested in, in perhaps uh, having a say on. And, and the, the people that uh, interest me more uh, in, in, in trying to understand how they uh, operated or how they embedded uh, uh, political changes in the making of a product or in the, the delivery of a service, <clears throat> I became mostly interested in, in those, two, uh, the, those two guys, uh, Amancio Ortega, this is the, 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 the uh, owner of Sara, and this is uh, Stelios Haji Ioano, who is the owner of 
uh, EasyJet. Uh, so uh, the reason why I, I became interested in, in those is because I thought they were the, the ones, I mean, Greenspan is obviously very important uh, in this kind of uh, theory of cheapness, uh, but <laughs> uh, uh, those, those two had more directly to do with the construction of uh, physical structure, uh, physical structures, the organizations of the organization of the of the collective body of people. I mean, talking about uh, flying people around uh, or dressing people, and and I think both of them, I I believe, had enormous impact in the way, uh, <coughs> uh, at least in Europe, in the way people now live in the cities in in Europe. I think the fact that you can buy clothes, uh, uh, fashion, let's say, at such uh, prices has completely turned around the way in which people look at themselves, people from perhaps uh, not so, uh, uh, not, not such a high level uh, uh, acquisitive uh, capacity, are able to look at themselves as, as part of the, 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 the routines of uh, fashion or ur urban fashion like anybody else. And I think that is a, that is a, a fundamentally new uh, 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 self-perception uh, of uh, people. And, and I think the same with flights. Now everybody can fly uh, uh, transcontinentally uh, f uh, for a very cheap uh, uh, price. <clears throat> so I started doing this kind of uh, uh, diagrams, uh, looking at the practice of those, uh, those two people in which uh, you can see the, the traditional, uh, the traditional uh, designers, uh, the, the fashion designers uh, on, the, on the upper left uh, corner. Those are the people uh, that were supposed to, um, to produce a whole uh, worldview, uh, to, to propose to the people a, a new way of understanding uh, uh, the world uh, and, and, and basically that, that added value that they were able to, to provide to the, their uh, products was what uh, enabled them to, to sell them very expensively. And on the contrary, there are these other people that I'm now very interested in, <coughs> which instead of thinking about uh, fashion as a uh, as, as that uh, almost ideo ideological practice of coming up with a new uh, holistic uh, idea about how should we dress and what kind of things uh, we should dress, these people are operating very specifically on how the, the, the products are procured and delivered to the, to the public. And by focusing there, they are able to lower uh, the prices to offer the prices at a at a at a much uh, <clears throat> more affordable uh, the, offer the, the products at a more affordable uh, uh, price uh, and uh, um, in, I mean there are differences between between them but I think the other the other important difference is that the the traditional fashion retailers. Uh, put a lot of emphasis in in that kind of creation of the image, the brand, the ideology, and, and those people are uh, almost scanning the field and picking things from uh, the market and somehow putting together the package. The same thing happens with, uh, with uh, airlines um, uh, and actually some of the, the most uh, interesting ideas that I've managed to put together on this came out of uh, thinking about Airlines, because again, you have the kind of glamour of uh, British Airways or Air France, uh, and then you have the, the almost uh, <clears throat> uh, livestock quality of, uh, of, uh, of EasyJet. Uh, I, here you have uh, JetBlue, I, I think. And, uh, but anyway, uh, I, I think that uh, some of these things are not, uh, <clears throat> uh, are, are, are interesting because for example, one of the things that low-cost airlines did was to declass de the airplane cabin. I mean, if we are talking about making uh, um, important changes to the uh, to the politics of uh, of the social uh, body, certainly uh, low-cost airlines did that, and and this is one of the uh, the things that make makes me hopeful that we can 
perhaps uh, do the same also with those uh, topographies that uh, I was uh, showing at the at the beginning. And now, more interestingly, uh, David Cameron in the UK, probably the future prime minister, has uh, proposed the EC Council and uh, is going to start making uh, uh, councils rule on the basis of uh, uh, low-cost airlines. I mean, probably uh, Schwarzenegger could also learn something from uh, from from that. And, and in turn, <coughs> Ryanair is using political discor uh, images and discourses to uh, advertise uh, their uh, products. Uh, I mean, that that has to do with with not exactly with with uh, with the political uh, uh, discourse, but this this has to do with the next uh, uh, thing, which is the way in which I I tried then to to um, re relate these problems to the to the problems in in architecture, which is by uh, looking at frills, no? Because uh, I mean, the the the, the low cost airlines are are known as uh, as no frills uh, airline, and I I thought that the frills was actually something that that start started to to do very directly or gave, gave me a, a handle into into architecture as a kind of uh, uh, contingent uh, excrescence of uh, the skin of uh, in in this case of of a cloth uh, that is uh, is made uh, for the sole purpose of uh, maybe seduction or or <clears throat> or beauty uh, and so uh, Sylvia actually uh, <laughs> recommended uh, some kind of uh, reading of uh, historical reading of uh, of uh, frills, uh, which uh, which I I try to <clears throat> explain very briefly because I'm running already way out of time. But basically, if you look at the history of architecture, you see that frills uh, were first of all eliminated uh, from. Uh, modernist, modernist uh, aesthetics as superfluous, uh, regressive, and uh, ineffective uh, on the grounds of, of uh, cost, of uh, uh, of value, uh, uh, but not of uh, style. So uh, that produced also its its own uh, problems, uh, like for example, Miss van der Rohe being asked to make uh, of the seagram something a little bit more. Um, uh, expensive or more uh, sophisticated, and, and then replying, "Well, build it in in bronze," or <coughs> uh, Costa uh, uh, um, forbidding the 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 finish of the the blocks in Brasilia to turn the corner to uh, privilege uh, certain uh, certain um, uh, people within the within the block following this this uh, modernist idea uh, to the limit of, of evenness or, or equality to the to the limit uh, there were also some other derivations of of these uh, poetics like uh, for example uh, if we try to make a history of uh, of uh, cheapness uh, probably brutalism is something that needs to have a chapter into into it uh, as uh, as a certain type of uh, mobilization of aesthetic the aesthetic value of uh, of poverty of impoverished uh, buildings buildings without without any any clothing any any uh, frills so when when the building uh, when the kind of uh, uh, explicitation, which which is, uh, I mean, to use a word that I I, I get from Slaughter, like that I think is quite interesting. The explicitation of how the building works uh, or performs directly in its uh, physical uh, appearance uh, becomes the main uh, aesthetic uh, driver, <coughs> uh, and also the 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 treatment or or, or the the. Uh, in a way, the, the 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 aesthetic of the the things that are left almost as uh, automatic products of, for example, the scaffolding patterns or or the the with 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 no with no dressing uh, is also part of of this kind of revision of uh, of uh, modernism, uh, but with a little bit not not just saying that or thinking that style is not style, but Style becomes uh, uh, or emerges out of 
that approach uh, uh, of, uh, of, of, the, of making visible the bare minimum in, in, a, in a building. That's, I think, what, uh, what probably uh, brutalism uh, explored. Then there was postmodernism, which had a, a different take on frills, uh, uh, because uh, for postmodernism, frills were were again legitimate on the on the grounds that even if if their use value is uh, is uh, negligible, their exchange value um, is uh, is profitable, and therefore in a in a in a late capitalist economy that is uh, a legitimate um, uh, strategy. And, and 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 then there are also all sorts of architects uh, that uh, uh, talk about the relationships between. Uh, style or aesthetics and uh, and value. Uh, Philip Johnson probably is one of the most uh, distinguished one, and everybody uh, has heard the the, the kind of self-deprecating uh, comment of uh, understanding himself as a as a prostitute uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I, at the same time, there are other other cultural fields that I think uh, need to be uh, taking into account. And in, interestingly enough. Uh, Arte Povera, uh, which is a label invented by uh, German Ocelland, who is today the president of the Prada Foundation, uh, and one of the first people that uh, started uh, uh, talking about uh, Frank Gehry, <coughs> uh, started uh, gathering this type of uh, artistic experimentation based, again, of uh, impoverishment, uh, uh, just at the, uh, uh, I think the, the first Arte Povera exhibition is in 67, uh, uh, Sara and uh, um, and Microsoft are founded in '75. So at the end of the of the uh, this happens just before the first oil oil crisis, and all these low cost operate, operators start appearing in the market uh, 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 just a few years uh, back. And so, uh, uh, to kind of uh, conclude, uh, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, trying to elucidate a little bit more precisely what the possibilities that this uh, background has left us uh, uh, today uh, in terms of our relationship with, uh, with frills and, and how cheapness is, is treated in, in, in this, there seem to appear two options. One is uh, the cheap uh, frills. Uh, that, that is what, for example, a company like Sara or, or Ryanair, that poster of the, of the girls in the, in the uh, jet engine, uh, was, was actually uh, due to uh, appear also in this uh, section. <clears throat> uh, but is, is the, the, the possibility of uh, uh, bringing uh, uh, something that is uh, exciting and extravagant at a very low uh, price by tampering with the with the procurement uh, routes of the of the of the product and that's where where uh, where the the kind of marketing um, uh, um, advantage of this approach lies this is what happens behind those dresses of uh, sara this is the kind of logistics the po of sara in coruña is one of the largest the uh, uh, in the world and is perfectly uh, organized and mechanized uh, to deliver uh, one collection every two weeks instead of every uh, season. And uh, I think that, I mean, trying to also getting, uh, trying to get closer to uh, architecture, uh, I thought that, that uh, Frank Gehry was, was uh, somebody who could uh, perhaps be associated to this type of, uh, of uh, uh, approach. Uh, also, as somebody that from very early on had been uh, uh, constantly interested in, in cheapness. Yesterday, I, I heard that he gave a lecture in, in Sayar where, where he was actually talking all the time about his interest in, in cheapness as a, as a, or his capacity of, uh, to operate within the, the, the world of uh, cheapness, but uh, still delivering uh, interesting and, and exciting uh, uh, products. Uh, you all know all this uh, work. Uh, and I, I think that what is very interesting uh, for me of, uh, of uh, his work is um, how as he moves from easy edges and, uh, and uh, his uh, house in Santa Monica 
to, let's say, more expensive budgets, uh, what you see appearing is that space, which is the space between the rain screen and the waterproofing membrane. Now, that is a space that uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know many European architects who would have had the stomach to, <laughs> uh, to produce that. Uh, I think that, uh, that you need to have a certain uh, capacity to accept that there is, uh, there is going to be a contradiction in the way you, you put a building because you have uh, contradicting uh, uh, performances to, uh, uh, to do with the, uh, with the building. Uh, and so you accept that that uh, space that, that uh, in, the, in, the, in the terms of the traditional discipline of architecture is, uh, is uh, absolutely uh, <coughs> uh, uh, bad, uh, is, uh, is not, not a good uh, practice, let, let's say. He embraces uh, uh, shamelessly and, and actually makes, uh, makes a virtue out of, uh, out of it, much like uh, perhaps some of these uh, low-cost uh, fabricators. Uh, so did you see that space between the, the substructure and the, and the waterproofing? That's basically the, the, the space that he, that he, in which he plays uh, with cheapness even in, in kind of more expensive buildings. The option uh, two is what I, I've called the no frills uh, uh, cool and <coughs> is, is more in the line of uh, traditional uh, modernism but, but, uh, but, but it, by intensifying uh, some of the, the uh, possibility of producing something with the absolute bare uh, minimum, uh, uh, the, the idea is that that becomes a certain uh, uh, stylistic uh, quality. And then, then there are, in, in this type of aesthetic, there are a number of parameters that are, that you see uh, uh, appearing again and again. Uh, one is, for example, the acceptance of the generic as a, as a, a quality of the, of the product. <clears throat> uh, the other is a certain kind of neo rusonian return to uh, uh, primitive uh, uh, nature as a quality of the of the product. This uh, Muji, uh, in this case, in the other case, it was Sarah. The example. There are probably other examples that we all can come up with, uh, but Muji, I think, is a is a great example of this no frills uh, cool. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that there are a number of uh, <clears throat> also architects that can be. Uh, related to uh, to this, uh, Rem in, with his famous uh, motto of no no detail, no money, no no detail. I think is is somebody who is exploring uh, already for some time that that idea. In the case of uh, Lille, for example, I remember conversations uh, that I don't think were ever implemented, but I thought were fascinating of uh, doing specifying in the master plan that. Uh, uh, in Lille, there could only be used low-grade concrete because low-grade concrete uh, used on an urban scale will produce mm, automatically an aesthetic that will be will differentiate Lille from Paris because Paris is all very precise, high-quality concrete, and Lille could not be uh, the same thing. So that kind of uh, arguments in which the, the 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 qualities of the of the material. Uh, emerge um, uh, out of out of this kind of state of bare minimum uh, to produce a style is uh, is some of the, the the things that I think he explored and and to end up uh, uh, this kind of small history of the of the frills uh, I would like to refer to the work of uh, uh, Lacaton and, and Vassal. This is the the Palais de, de Tokyo in in Paris, which is probably the the cheapest uh, museum per square meter ever built uh, and basically it's a, it's a refurbishment which also uh, uh, has something to do with this idea of, uh, of economy but it's a, a refurbishment that is <coughs> done basically by stripping bare the, the building uh, and uh, uh, this is also some of their, their other work in which, in which you see also that quality of the generic of the industrially uh, uh, produced of the transparent, as opposed perhaps of the of the of the enclosure that uh, that uh, probably we can, we can see in Gary, uh, many of these uh, uh, works explore this kind of 
continuity with the outside, continuity with nature, uh, again, this kind of neo uh, Russonian uh, uh, approach that I was, I was uh, referring to earlier. This is also some uh, of the work from Lacaton Basal using uh, fiber, cement, and plywood, and, and uh, all kinds of things. Again, nature, casualness, uh, which, which I think is, is almost like taking that idea of economy, uh, the, the literal penetration of nature within the space of the, uh, of the building as, as a frequent trait in, 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 in the way this, uh, this uh, new uh, contemporary poverty uh, 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 occurs in, in the buildings of, of those. And, and, and just to, to finish the, the, the presentation, I, I, I thought it was interesting to make a relationship between that uh, possibility of exploring uh, cheapness or, or impoverishment as an aesthetic uh, trait uh, and related to, uh, to, to this uh, idea of bare life that, that Agamben uh, uh, puts uh, forward in which it is actually uh, those people who are deprived of uh, the full uh, citizenship rights, uh, those that have the highest potential to, uh, to subvert uh, the, the, the status uh, quo. The, this uh, image that, that you see there is, is a design from a Japanese fabricator, uh, Japanese uh, clothier uh, called Final home that makes uh, urban clothes almost for the homeless to be filled out with newspapers. Uh, again, uh, relating to that, uh, to that uh, neo uh, russonian um, uh, uh, trend that, that I can see emerging already in some of uh, these experiments. I, I think this is the latest, the latest uh, uh, image from the presentation. Thank you very much. So I feel as though I have to say something other than I, gr I agree with what he said, um, which is going to be tough. I suppose, I suppose really the only um, uh, below the belt comment I would have, and I'm just going to get it off my chest right at the beginning, uh, would be to say, well, what class did you fly from London to LA in? <laughs> and, I told you it was unfair. I admit that it's unfair. But I, anyway, I felt as though I, I absolutely had to. Hitoshi wouldn't be happy if I didn't send off at least one incredibly cheap shot. Um, uh, um, and I suppose the only other thing I would say is that final home is actually kind of expensive. So, um, so I, I could probably just sit down and end there, which is to say that economic arguments always end up in that kind of riddle where you're showing very expensive clothing for homeless people stuffed with newspaper. So, I mean, in some way, we're going to get maybe to that as a, as a bottom line. Um, but just a, a couple of things that, that I would uh, um, sort of add, and, and, and really, uh, uh, this is the, the end result of a, of a series of email exchanges that Alejandro and, and I have been having. So I think of this as really very friendly and extremely informal banter. And mine is much less worked out than his. It's just, uh, uh, you know, if I could have just Twittered and tweaked this in, it's, it's at that level of discourse, I would say. Um, OK, so, so I would say when, uh, when uh, economic crises loom, architects turn to writing, and they turn to writing about money. And so that's part of where we're at. And I think that you simply cannot begin the discussion without understanding that at the back, necessarily, of every architect's mind when they're talking about money and crisis is how to get work. So I, I don't mean that as a cheap shot. Uh, I think it's a very expensive shot for the field. Um, so what would be the architecture of cheapness? Does it, does it look sort of like this? And um, uh, I think there are lots of scary things about this image. And probably, uh, at least in my opinion, money is not the thing that would solve all of the things that produce the terror of an image like this. Um, 
I, I would also add, though, in uh, having now seen Alejandro's presentation, that his images of all of those towers in Turkey are way more scary than this, in, in my opinion. And I think that anything that is that scary and that horrifying is absolutely a fertile field to um, explore. So, so I would say that when I say that I agree with what he said, that's what I mean. But in any case, this, this kind of architecture of cheapness is not a problem of money. And I think that money does not, is not the, uh, the answer to all uh, of the crises that have apparently architectural form. So there's been a lot of discussion about how to deal with New Orleans, and I'm not sure money is the, is the bottom line. And I don't think that more money just makes it right. And I think that one crisis is not the same as another crisis. So if you want to start looking at very large quantities of the problem of housing and where it's probably not the middle class, it's refugees and a real architecture of crisis. But then you have to even start looking a little bit uh, more detail. This image um, uh, uh, was sent to me in, in another email exchange by the photographer Ari Markopoulos. Um, and he had been to Italy. These are the images of people living uh, um, after the earthquake very recently. This is, and it's part of a suite of photographs called Six Months After the Earthquake. And um, uh, I didn't know how to tell him very gently that it, it just didn't seem that crisisful to me. It looked very orderly. They looked like very nice tents. I mean, you know, they looked like the beach in Malibu, you know, over Thanksgiving weekend. And, um, uh, you know, there's no evil in this image. There no, that it was a natural catastrophe of the buildings that were built and fell down or from the 15th century. There's no bad guy, no cheap developer that put them together. And um, anyway, if you continue to think about all of these things, I think that you would find uh, questions of money might not be the, the way that you would distinguish between an image such as this one and an image such as this one. Although, although they all do get to the question of the final home. Um, OK, so back to the real, what we're really talking about, which is an image like this. And there's not enough of it. And it's falling. And it's, you know, money is, in fact, uh, cheaper. And there isn't enough of it to go around. Um, another thing that I would say about money, man, that, you know, for those of us who are on furlough, you know, that hurts. That, that really hurts a lot. Um, but uh, the fact of the ma matter is that money is an extremely unreliable source of value. It, the one thing that we can say about the value of money is that it's constantly changing from day to day, from state to state, from situation to situation. So I suppose um, you know, one concern for me would be an architectural theory that was rooted in uh, money as value may not ever be able to be as more reliable than the parts that go into it. You get forced into um, things like this, uh, in which this is, this is the logo of some design firm. And their whole thing is that you get to pick two, not three. <laughs> Maybe we could talk later about which two you would pick. You know, I, I could probably guess. Uh, um, uh, OK. So you know, Alejandro and I had begun a discussion about Gary a little bit and about this notion of, uh, of cheapness and what happens to cheapness. And you know, the, we all know the stories about the plywood and the chain link and, and so forth. And I suppose you would really have to do a different kind of square foot cost thing to find out exactly how cheap is cheap. Uh, but I think that the other thing is that cheapness in this case probably has a question of duration that you would have to think about. So can you think about this as an architecture of cheapness without understanding what happened to it over the long run? Um, this is the serpentine, which is not the most expensive thing that he ever did. But I mean, you simply wouldn't begin the discussion about this uh, overly membered, overly timbered, et cetera. It wouldn't be on the matter of cheapness. So uh, can you separate them out, or is this the final aestheticization of the cheapness? I'm, I'm not sure. I think it's a question that I would ask. Um, the other thing about, uh, uh, about the, the, the 
you know, models of cheapness and so forth that you brought up the chopping, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, in fact, uh, you know, there's now long since been this new uh, page in T magazine, which is called the high low instead of the down low. And it's about precisely uh, mediating excessive cheap fashion with the single item of, of high fashion. And I wonder, again, this is, I suppose my question is how broadly do you look at the territory? Is the city Zara and the work that you want to do, the, the Gucci, you know, in that context? So there is something about how close in you look uh, that I think is, you know, maybe something that we could, uh, that we could uh, talk about. Um, to continue this, the, the conversation about Gary uh, and the issue of cheapness, you look at something like the Lewis House, um, I think it would be hard to describe this in terms of expense. It's certainly the most expensive house ever not built. And Lewis said, it was the cheapest way for me to become a significant patron of architecture because all I had to pay was a couple of million dollars in fees instead of the $150 million that it would have cost to build even part of it. So I'm not sure at what point cheapness enters into this. And, you know, it was also this project that began, you know, that was the home of a kind of notion of recycling. You know, this is a, the first model I showed is a later model. This is an earlier one. I'm sure you all know the story. This is where Katia first enters the firm. And, and I think that the Katia as the, Katia is for Gary the, the picture of the factory of Zara that you showed. It's the delivery system that adjudicates cheapness. So Katia gets used in the Gary office for the first time to digitize and rationalize what had been a handmade, pressed, velvet, very frilly part of the Lewis house. And then the only word that I can think of it for it now is that shape. I mean, the actual digital file gets recycled again and again from big scale to small scale. So, you know, it requires different engineering and so forth, but one might think of that as a kind of cheap way to deploy a design idea that has these multiple, uh, multiple, um, uh, you know, literally multiple <coughs> ways. I'm sure you also know the story of this. This is the Sarah guest house for the Lewis house. Um, uh, Gary was trying to deal with the, the very volatile relationship he has with Sarah uh, and, uh, I mean, Stella, I'm sorry, and invited him in to do the guest house. And uh, they had whatever conversation they had. And the amount, a million dollars, was mentioned over dinner or drinks or whatever it was. And then it turned out the next day uh, that Stella thought that the million dollars was his fee and that Frank had meant that the million dollars was the budget for the, the construction budget. And uh, so again, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, does that make a cheap painting? I, 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 I don't, I mean, I, I think these are uh, uh, questions. Um, I, you know, I think that the issue of Rem, is he an architecture of cheapness? I certainly think that he spends his money in a different way than Gary does. I think that they both certainly have a kind of tightness, a tight wadness about the detail. Uh, on the other hand, I think that Rem hides the detail in enormous scales. So the very, very, very big detail is nevertheless a detail. So you have a relatively generic construction everywhere except, you know, 80 feet up in the air um, where there is an incredible, uh, you know, an incredible amount of money uh, spent at this, uh, literally, this high point. Um, just for fun, I uh, googled cheap architecture, and this is what I got. Um, Toru is going to remind me the architect because this is a well-known Japanese uh, project. Uh, cheap architecture, but look at the name of the website. <laughs> uh, okay, 
So this is where Alejandro went with the, the re relating cheapness to decoration and, and ornament, and you definitely get to minimalism and, uh, and, and, and so forth. And I suppose that back to the question of who is Gucci and who is Zara in the overall urban, uh, oops, sorry, in the overall urban condition, uh, part of the question I think has been asked again and again uh, historically is what if the answer is that architecture itself is the frill? and that the rest of the thing is the clothing and the rest of the thing is the body. And if you can't find a way to do that, you end up doing something else. So there, you know, you could go back and look at this question of decoration. Uh, let's just call it inexpensive so it doesn't have the, the ideological uh, weight of cheapness. So if you think of Le Corbusier at Pesach and, um, you know, the whole discussion about paint. Paint is, paint is probably a pretty inexpensive way to deal with the architecture of decoration. Um, you know, it was all painted white originally. It was still painted. The paint was a problem, so people came in and painted it like this. Uh, but the, the question here was about the color of the paint rather than the expense of the paint. There are important historical monuments in which entire fictive buildings that have made it straight into the canon of architecture are in fact made out of nothing but stucco and paint. And probably cheapness wouldn't be the way this kind of cheapness maybe doesn't enter into the conversation. Um, I couldn't help but show this. I think Harry Cobb said about uh, Peter Eisenman's uh, uh, convention center in Columbus, Ohio, that he never saw paint do as much work as it had to do here. Uh, but you know, still, that's a pretty inexpensive way to go. Um, at any rate, I wanted to, I'm just bringing these things up in order to try to separate the very persistent idea that ornament um, is to be understood in terms of expense. There is also inexpensive ornament. Um, and one might go back to thinking about uh, what constitutes ornament and a whole different attitude towards ornament. If you go back to Ruskin, for example, uh, for Ruskin, the expression of ornament, the presence of ornament was the last vestige of the presence of human labor, the excess of human labor in the developing market economy. So, you, so there, there would be a whole lot of ways to uh, uh, think about this. So OK, no frills. I just, I, I couldn't help but think about, you know, why is no frills so associated with flying? And, um, uh, and I think it's because uh, planes are really, really scary places to be. You're, for me, every, Dana is laughing at me at the front, in the front row because she knows, like, I have to be massively medicated in order to get on a plane. Uh, uh, so, so I'm projecting wildly here, but nevertheless, you know, being 30,000 feet up in the air over tons of explosive, uh, you know, every, every one of you must go into deep denial about the nature of that circumstance or you would never get on a plane again. So all of the business about no frills is really just a way to avoid the potential of, of, the, uh, of the thrill and the potential of this, you know, when you get to easy, no frills, uh, these were the pilots of the crash. They made 16,000 a year. And I think that there is a tremendous amount of repression about anxiety of, of the thrill and the uh, real uh, cost of some of these kinds of ideas. So let's just use that as a metaphor. <laughs> I could have put of the architect, but you know, the death of the architect is sort of overused. OK, so what about this? There's no anxiety here. This is happy. This is, you know, the, the Valium is in the orange juice here. So you definitely don't need any worry about what class you're in. You don't even know what class you're in. Uh, but I was thinking of Disney because they use this <laughs> as the way that they describe the ideology of going to Disneyland. So uh, I'm thinking no frills is bad, and yes, uh, thrills is good. And um, OK. So. Uh, 
maybe this is thrilling to some of you. These are some uh, extremely expensive, very, very crazy, crazy expensive uh, clothes by Ray Kawakubo. And these are some not so expensive clothes by Ray Kawakubo that were sold at H&M. And I suppose one question that we might have would be, can you tell the difference? I know you can tell the difference between that and that. I'm not sure that you can tell the difference between that and that, uh, although I guarantee you it has many, many zeros involved in the difference. But that's not even so much my point. My, my point is this. Um, uh, the lines, the morning that the Ray Kawakubo clothing line for H&M came out, there were line, people waited in line for 8, 12 hours, depending on the city. The line uh, here in LA, the, every single item was sold in the first 13 minutes that the store was open. The store was open at 6 a.m. Now, if architecture could mobilize that kind of interest, <laughs> I would say, go for it. And I don't think that what mobilized the interest in getting that dress was that it was cheap, but that it had, a, yes, it had some degree of accessibility in economic terms, but it was also thrilling from whatever point of view you brought to it. So here is an architecture. This is the Museum of Modern Art. I'm going to give you some examples that I think of as cheap thrills rather than just the architecture of cheapness. Here is an architecture that is very modest, although it was not cheap at all. This is the Museum of Modern Art. And it basically always looked like that, never rising to any kind of occasion whatsoever. Somebody like Pipilotti Rist comes in for very low amounts of money, and the lines were out the door absolutely out the door every single day to get in to see this. So somehow mobilizing the desire of an audience, producing a desire, producing an audience that has desire for whatever it is that you have to sell, even if it's, the, you know, even if all you're interested in is selling them your services, I would say sell it better. And, you're, and I don't think you're going to do it with cheapness, you're going to do it with thrills. I would also say, when I say that it's the death of the architect not understanding the nature of the thrill, um, I would say that this is something that needs to be thought about in terms of market share. Increasingly, I, you know, Alejandro may be worried about the architects that are building 50,000 units of housing in Istanbul. I'm just talking, you know, why are they doing urban renewal in, in Graz or wherever this was, and why, aren't they, why are they not hiring an architect? So there are lots of projects that are increasingly not being given to architects. So this is, the re this is a new auditorium. You know, you look at it closely, it's, it's felt, it's made, done by Claudia Youngstra. Uh, it could have been an architect, but it's not. Um, this is a conversation that I have again and again. I'm just moving now to end up here in LA. This is a conver an ongoing conversation I have with Annie Philbin down at the Hammer. You know, the, the lo this is the lobby of the Hammer that some of you, I hope, have been to many times. And they have a project, and they do it again and again and again. I mean, I consider this a kind of architectural renovation project. And it has never gone to an architect. It would never cross their mind to go to an architect. It's just simply uh, not the way they think. And, and frankly, I think that's your fault as architects, not their fault. So. I mean, and, and now it continues, and now I think that the stakes get big. So the Herzog and Demeron uh, Museum in Miami that's about to open, you know, the facade, you may talk about uh, aluminum and glass and so on and so forth, but the fact of the matter is that the facade is being done by Doug Aiken and is not really being done by Herzog and Demeron. So, you know, let's talk about cheap architecture, maybe. Uh, this is an unbuilt project. Uh, it was a collaboration between, her, uh, between uh, Rem Koolhaas and John Baldessari. Uh, uh, the trucks were to be painted a different color. They were all, to, these are Caltrans trucks. They were supposed to go out all over the city and essentially pixelate the city like an, uh, like an impressionist painting and come back. You know, this would be a kind of inex cheap thrills. Um, I think that, Jason, I don't know if you're here, uh, but I think that the question of color, the application of color on the, on the underside of your curling lashes, uh, I mean, it's a very simple idea. It has absolutely nothing to do with money, but I, I do think that it's the kind of project that might well uh, attract people to stand out in line 
uh, for you. And I wanted to just end uh, with this image because I know a lot of you saw it the other day when Neil uh, presented his uh, presented his work. Um, I, I don't think that thrilling architecture has to come at the cost. I, 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 I don't know what money is. I don't know what the value is. Um, I don't think that you could do, you, you would describe this in terms of cheapness, but I, but I also don't think that the vividness and the effectiveness of the image uh, is uh, something, to be, something to be neglected. And I, and I would just conclude this by saying the handrail, you know, Neil, <laughs> Uh, so I, I would say that the question of cheapness is like I'm, you know, I'm not going to look at the handrail. Okay, th this is my inexpensive gift to you, Neil, because the rest of it is the rest of it is uh, is good. Anyway, so uh, uh, yeah, okay, that's my point. I'm done. And we <laughs> uh. I had one thing that I just. Uh, completely struck by the the idea that you would equate the revulsion that you feel looking at the Istanbul Towers mm -hmm. to the revulsion that you feel looking at the section of the skin on the Gary building you know like the six inches of poche between the thing and the thing and and, and you you would consider those to be equivalent crimes no no I didn't say that oh I thought you did no, no oh no, it's no, better no. if you do <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I, I, I don't know whether I explain myself uh, uh, properly. I don't, I don't think that the, the, <clears throat> the six inches of poche space between the brain screen and the waterproofing is uh, revulsive. Is in fact liberating. It's a real idea, and it's an, a real idea that comes out of somebody who knows the trade very well and starts doing things with corrugated steel and other things. And when he has to do a <clears throat> $200 million project, he uh, applies similar criteria, um, but in a way in which I don't think any other architect had done before. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying it, I'm putting it as a kind of positive way of applying economy to, to, to the trade and being able to produce an entirely new aesthetic. And <clears throat> in a way, that's, that's what I, I would like to, to pose as a, as a question to what you are you are saying that the no thrills is the death the death of uh, architecture because yes you can say architecture is by almost by definition the ornament that's what architects do we ornate what we do <coughs> but at the same time I think that the process of uh, relationship between desire and necessity is uh, are are not are not that uh, single directional, and I think that if we are able to uh, uh, address or to profit some of those uh, markets, but not only markets, because I, I don't think it's it's only a, a question of uh, of selling architecture. It's also a question of, of having a say in how cities will be become in the in the future. We are going to have to start generating the desire out of necessity. I mean, it, 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 some of these things that I showed at the, at the beginning are at the same time maybe uh, at the same time repulsive on, on, a, on, on a certain level, but also incredibly liberating and democratic in the sense that they are making cities available to more and more people. Now, half of the people in the globe are, are living in cities. There is another half that is going to move to the cities uh, soon. Citizens are about three times wealthier than, than people living in the, in the countryside. So there is, a, there is a, a number of issues that are happening on a very large scale uh, and are being put in the hands of uh, certain people that do them efficiently, but maybe, but, but maybe not not extracting the potential they they have. <clears throat> and I think that trying to, I mean, you can operate as a, as an architect or as an artist in the world of uh, of uh, of art, but but 
I, I think that that is almost like a, like a very small audience compared to the one that is that is uh, possible if we are able to turn those needs or those necessities into into desires. So I mean, like the, the if if our role is simply to create, uh, uh, put it in another way, I don't think that our role is just to create thrills. Is to solve problems, and there are problems on a very large scale out there that we are completely detached from. I don't know exactly why, and, but I, I kind of guess why, because we've been incompetent also yeah, at, at doing certain, certain things. Well, but I think it's also a quite, uh, you know, that, uh, there are lots of problems to solve that everybody shares responsibility in figuring out ways to solve them. I mean, I think that there is a little bit of hubris to think that the problem of the global city is the problem of the architect. I mean, you know, there are a why, lot of factors. <clears throat> I, I mean, I think that if there is one very big problem <laughs> that architects done. have to address today is the, is the problem of the global city or the problem of the global warming. Of, uh, or, or so many other problems that, that are being addressed and, and uh, by, in a way... By, by multiple professions and by multiple constituencies, I'm just saying, so you're not special that you want to deal with the big city because everybody has to deal with that, no? Yes. So the question then becomes trying to identify where your, <clears throat> where your power base, what the tools are that permit you to be effective. Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I have some ideas that maybe in order to be effective on those fields, we, we need to address uh, architecture in a, in, a, in a much more technically uh, capable manner. While I think that architects have been, I don't know if distracted, but, but I, I, I think they've been busy thinking in a... In a in how to produce thrills, if you if uh, if you want architectural thrills, no, I, and I think I that kind of has has. Uh, <laughs> huh? I know, no, I know, but I guess. So, look, you said you said several times hmm. that it's time for architects to regain. I tried to write it down, but I, it was dark. Ages. Retrieve yeah. lost power. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, I wonder what that power is that you've lost, because I mean, it seems to me that those cities. That that's a new power potential. To, when I look at Istanbul like that, I don't think of that as a territory that architects lost. I think of that as a new territory that is developed without architects. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, that's a little bit different to say that you knew how, you used to know how to do it and you need to remember how to do it and rather to say this is a whole new phenomenon and you have to develop a new way of thinking about it. Which is, which is why the Ray Kawakubo example, of, of all of the people that I ever thought could, uh, the, and how, how do we put it, Ray Kawakubo never struck me as somebody who could have a mass audience. I mean, nothing but thrill. I mean, look at those things. You can't even see out of them. I mean, talk about non-functional. Absolutely non, the, a disaster. So what happened that that became the target for a mass audience? And I don't think that she found a, a lost power. She invented a new audience. And, and it's a big one. And it has an urbanism. It, it has all of the things that you're talking about. But, but, I, but I, 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 I don't think that she could do that without some notion of the thrill. It's not simply a notion of cheapness. And I don't think Zara can do what Zara is doing without the fact that Ray Kawakubo is doing what she's doing. I mean, who, who is Zara? How does, if everybody adopted the Zara model, who would they be knocking off? Uh, I, I think, that, I mean, this is also an interesting, an interesting question because we perhaps live in a, in a, in a culture where there are, they, there are channels where you can almost collect uh, spontaneous intelligence without having necessarily to uh, commission these things to, to special 
people, special special designers. For example, the, the model of uh, Topshop is more interesting in that sense than than Sarah because they don't they don't they don't just scout the the catwalks in the, in Milan and in Paris. They they look in the street, uh, you know, in the markets. And this except is also now happens. they're all wearing Zara clothes. Is what? Is? Well, I mean, part of what I was thinking, you were saying that Zara has brought fashionability yeah. to classes that didn't have access to it. Yes. So, and I think that's a that's a well taken point. I think it's important. So, but if you follow it down the line, that's why I just wonder hmm. how long the argument can be sustained. If you follow it down the line, then sooner or later, everybody has the same fashionability. So when everybody's wearing Zara, where does Topshop go? Well, the thing is that Zara is uh, is is not, uh, uh, it doesn't have a single aesthetic and it doesn't have a single even uh, audience as opposed to even some of the other uh, clothing manufacturers. It ranges between kids to young girls to uh, business clothing for, for men. They, they, they pride themselves on the, on the fact that they are neither specializing on a certain style, like for example Muji, nor on a certain audience group. They, they cover a very broad range of, uh, of, uh, of uh, audiences. But if you go into Zara, yeah. <clears throat> pretty much everything you see, it's not that anybody is excluded, it's that everything in it is a derivation of something recognizable. Exactly. So, it, so, the, so the economy of Zara requires this other thing in order to come into being. Yes, but, right? but what I'm saying is that, that uh, in the case of Sarah, perhaps they are copying Prada and, and other um, uh, high-end uh, clothiers, but in the case of Topshop, they are copying the guy in the little shop around the corner right. in Covent Garden, or not in Covent Garden, but in, in Camden Town, that uh, is uh, putting together clothes uh, that are, for some reason, interesting, or dyeing t-shirts, or doing these kind of things. I think, I mean, in Japan, for example, is, is uh, also uh, a market that has some of these almost low, uh, uh, small-scale uh, emerging fashion that that then is, is maybe taken taken over by Kabakubo. I, I don't know uh, to what degree also these guys that are, that are supposed to be synthesizing the, the high fashion are not actually constantly looking at uh, what they see uh, when they walk around in the street in Harajuku or in, 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 uh, in Camden town. So the question is whether you still need the figure of the author mediating those things, or there are mechanisms wh whereby, and those I think uh, exist already in, 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 for example, Topshop, where they, they themselves, as a kind of corporate, or, or, or as, a, as a production machine, rather than as an author, uh, they, they look at those trends and they incorporate them, literally, by even buying directly from these small, um, uh, uh, production units, the clothes, and marketing them in the in the in the store. So, <clears throat> I think that that I mean, the, the problem of, of uh, authorship is also uh, related to, to to all this, and and for me, is one of the problems that has led architects into being disempowered. You you say that the problem that we see happening in Istanbul or in Mumbai or in so many of these. <coughs> place is a problem that didn't exist for architects before. And, and that is true. That, that is an entirely new situation that, uh, that nobody had to face before, but it, was a, it is a situation that would have fallen naturally in our, in our control as a kind of discipline. And it has, it has gone into the project managers, quantity surveyors, uh, engineers and other other uh, technicians that, that have grown around the the, the 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 field of architecture and and now are are taking the, the lead in those in those uh, fields and those people are not not I mean those disciplines are 
I mean, it's very difficult to say. Maybe it's not precise to say it like that. But I think they, they had less of a political stance than architecture has traditionally had. There I, there I think I would just, in historical terms, disagree in, in the sense that I, I think that very persuasive arguments have been made, that it was engineers, for example, who invented the idea of design for the public good. And that in the 18th century, when engineering first developed, architects dealt, worked for clients and engineers were for the public. I mean, there was no notion that there would be. So, so in fact, if you look at it historically, uh, I think you would have to say that the, those large-scale mass Projects. things, in fact, began. They always were the home of the engineer. And I think, uh, I mean, we were talking about this before. I don't know if any of you were at this conversation the other day that uh, took place uh, with Mia Lehrer. And um, one of the things that she was, she sort of had a map of L.A. that showed the <coughs> number of acres that Mia Lair, you could put Mia Lair's name on it. This is a landscape architect. And it was, it was whoa. Like, that was a lot. That was, like, that was, that was just unbelievable. And there she is, the landscape architect, handing out work to engineers and handing out work to architects. And, you know, it, it had, quote, naturally fallen to her. <laughs> and uh, so I, I guess I would just say that this is, this is, a territory that architects have to take. It, 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 it's not their right. It's not their natural birthright. It's not their disciplinary history. It's in fact always been adjacent to the history. And and it, I mean, I'm not saying don't try to take it at all, but but I but I don't think that it's a thing that you've lost. I, I think it's a thing that the field has never risen to the occasion to take over. So now this may your your thinking may be the way to do it. But, um, but, but I don't think that then the, histor the historical models don't work in your favor, which is neither here nor there. I don't know exactly the projects that, that you are referring to, but most of the, the fabrics that are growing in, in developing uh, countries, I think, you know, these, these towers would fall more in the, in, in, the, in the field of architecture than in the field of landscape design or civil engineering. You mean the, 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 these blocks. You, you think they should now? No, no, they, they I mean, who, who built houses before, not the civil engineers, not the landscape architects, not the project managers, not the quantity surveyors, none of these people that are now in the most important roles in, in leading those, those projects are architects. No, I understand that, but I'm but I'm just saying the things that then made it possible to to have any houses were things like sewers and streets yes. and the notion of a public and the notion of a city yeah. and 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 the architects never had anything to do with that originally. They they came in and did the monuments. I mean, so I, I'm I'm just yeah, I'm only referring to this hmm. this notion that there is a natural history of the field and hmm. the lapsarian model. We used to do this. We used yeah. to no. You never did it. Yeah, and so. You, you never did it, and therefore you don't have the expertise to do it. So, <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, so, so you, you have all no, expertise, no. but I, you personally. <laughs> no, let's say I'm, I'm interested in that type of, uh, of, uh, of expertise, and I think that is the expertise, uh, or let's say the project that I'm interested in is, is the project of turning needs into desires rather than, than, than trying to generate desires that then out of I don't know what. I, mean, I think that the, the model that you were the the, the example of uh, of Raika Bakubo, of creating creating desire, I, I think maybe and and have no no answer for any real needs because as you say the the, the, the clothes are the clothes are not necessarily functional. Um, I mean that may be one one approach. I don't think that is an approach that will work in the field of architecture. Because architecture is oh, architecture is closer to infrastructure is too expensive uh, to be non-functional. You can actually allow yourself to be non-functional in the monuments, but not in the in ninety-five percent of what gets built. 
And I think that the problem is that the people who are in charge of determining how this 95% uh, is to be built have no interest and no, no idea on how to, if you want, monumentalize or, 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 or ornamentalize, if, if you think that that is the core of what architects do. And therefore, they become territories that are completely deprived on, of any, any, any thrills, any quality, any interest. They are just... I guess, I, I mean, I, I think we should open it up to the audience. I, I, get, I guess I, I, I just, uh, I, I want to just make it clear that I, and by the way, this is the cheapest wine that anybody ever. It's true. I mean, it's like so cheap. It's like just despicable. So again, another argument for like the, you know, cheapness is not all good. <laughs> See, I'm drinking. She's not drinking. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I guess, I guess, uh, you know, before be, before turning it over to the audience, I, I, um, I, 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 I suppose what I'm what I what I what I want to say is not that I think that architecture is inconsequential and merely ornamental, but I do think that historically every argument that has been made about architecture that didn't take the thrill into account didn't work. So I say it as a friendly amendment. <laughs> You're, the argument has to include a theory of thrills, or it won't fly. It and I mean that I think there is there is endless and and I think the strongest part of the argument is when it's the most ugly because it, you know uh, those things are really ugly. But do you, you know that this 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 uh, housing that. Uh, that I showed it, the first ones that, that I pictured, uh, photographed. The orangey it. ones? The orangey ones. <laughs> if you see the Korean ones, these kind of extruded concrete blocks, yeah. those are... Not so bad. No, they're not so bad, but they're actually produced by engineers. They are totally... My point exactly. No, 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 exactly. No, no, but the, 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 I mean, this so is... So it was the architects that produced the orange, horrible... Exactly. Ex the, okay, kind of, my exactly. The okay. bad architects are the ones, and, and, and actually that orange, orange horrible is thrilling for a certain class, for a certain <laughs> em, emerging urban class yeah. in, in, the, in the Middle East and in the, in the Far East and, and probably also in Europe and in the States. And Rodeo Drive. Exactly. I mean, I think it's no different that just Rodeo Drive is a little bit more money. It's not a problem of money. It's not a problem of money, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so we see we agree. <laughs> I have no idea what time it is, but but I feel as though we should be ending, and you should have some. Do you questions. want to take questions from the audience or comments or? <laughs> it's, it's a really good vinegar, though. <laughs> um, Sylvia, long time listener, first time caller. Um, <laughs> You gave, you gave... Wait, 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 I'm sorry, everybody was like, I didn't hear, long time what, and first time who? Okay, I guess you had to be there. All right, go ahead. Uh, you, gave, you gave Neil a pass on the spatial and the material because you like the graphic. And you gave, and, and, and in Jason's project, I mean, while, while the color is, is cheap, the, the shingle itself is, is custom, right? And maybe expensive. And I'm guessing, I'm wondering, are you advocating, and, and then the, the effect of projection images you showed as kind of a, a, a more advanced paint job is the solution for thrill in architecture. Is, is, that, is that kind of what you were advocating? Uh, I was trying to separate out money from the thrill. And if you really want to do it cheaply, there are ways to do it. But, and what I was trying to say about Neil's project was that he, I mean, as he made very clear the other night, part of what drives him is to produce the eidetic and memorable image. And that has to do with an intensity of experience that has nothing to do with money. And part of what I was arguing is that that's a way to produce an audience that might want more 
in this case, engineering. <laughs> I mean, you know, in the case of the models that you were looking at. And I'm not sure I gave Neil a pass. I, I think Neil is going to be pissed at me for weeks because I mentioned the handrail. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't call that a pass. I, I would not call that a pass at all. I, but I mean, I, I really, I, I would also say, you know, I mean, Alejandro and I also had a long exchange about handrails. I mean, handrails are one of those, you know, uh, things that always comes back to haunt the architect. A kind of necessity, uh, the kind of thing that the thrilling high design never wants to deal with. And then at the end, you know, you all talk about value engineering, but the, the people that you really hate are the handicapped people that make you put, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, you do. You hate them. And how, how, how many, you don't like taking the classes where you have to learn about it? And how many houses designed by many of you here I have been into, in which part of the story is the handrail was there, and as soon as the building inspector left, you took it out. I mean, you know, that's, that's really reverse engineering. It's the handrail. And, and I have to say that I kind of admire the fact that there is that handrail that's sticking right in the, you know, that eyeball because it has to be there. It just doesn't, it doesn't bother me. Sorry. See, now he's going to be mad at me for six weeks instead of just. That was a cheap project. I thought you were going to tell me it was a cheap shot. I'm, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, 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 I, I think I just, I really strongly believe I, I'm, I'm, uh, look, I, I tried to say at the beginning. Uh, I think it takes incredible intelligence and an incredibly creative mind to put those towers up in Istanbul and say architects have to figure out a way to deal with that. And I, and I also meant it. I think that to put up something that we would all easily accept as an image of architectural criminality, to put that next to the Gary section, no European architect would ever do that, to, to render them equivalent in some way, um, I think that's, that's endlessly smart because it's true. No traditional notion of the organic nature of design and that skin has to express. I mean, think of all of the architectural theory that you would know that would make both that, those orange towers and that poche fill section equally criminal. And so I completely agree that I think that the problem uh, has been, a, a new problem has been identified. And we should all be so lucky that once ever we get to identify a new problem. And as Alejandro was also admitting, then the, the question becomes, how do you resolve the new problem? And I, I'm really just trying to say that money can't be the only way that you do it. No. And, and I'll send you an email no, nice. in which Alejandro yeah, did <laughs> say, in the end, you can't not have thrills. But we're trying to argue. We, Hitoshi wanted us to argue. <laughs> so we're not telling you the parts where we agree. Great. Yeah, you know, architecture is, amongst other things, a space to make thrills. That's pretty good. Yeah. And I showed you the temporary ones because the materials were cheap, and uh, but they wouldn't have to uh, be cheap. But, but I also, you know, was really trying to say that, like, at the Hammer, for example, I think it's a problem for architects to try to figure out why that lobby, would, it would never cross somebody's mind who is culturally very sophisticated. You're not talking about a farmer from the plains of Anatolia moving to Istanbul who's happy to live in a tower, which is the person that you're talking about. You're talking about a director of a museum. Why the director of a museum, it would never cross their mind that an architect might have something to do with a building I mean, I think that's as big a problem as the Anatolian farmer. No, it's a much smaller one. Much more irrelevant. Much smaller one, yeah, scale-wise. Okay, well, so, yeah, scale-wise. Yeah, scale-wise scale for sure.
Yeah. But but I mean this is this is the real this is the, this is why I'm interested in cheapness. It's a matter of uh, it's a problem of of scale. I I'm not saying that this is not an architectural problem, but I think the real problem that we are uh, simply sideline is is the big problem. Yeah, and, and I think if you we, figure out the first one, it'll help you figure out the second one. Probably. Okay. I mean, I'm not I'm not saying they are they are entirely entirely disconnected, but. Uh, th this is wh why I, I like Gary in, in that sense, because I think he goes between making houses and furniture to making uh, museums, and you can see that there is a kind of uh, precision in terms of dealing with the economy of the, of the project that I, I don't think many architects have. Well, I think the Katia question, I, I mean, the, the, you know, was, I was thinking when you were showing option A and, sh and option B at the end, um, I think, I think that Katia is actually both option A and option B because Katia essentially yeah. finds the generic underneath the skin, and 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 I uh, I, I think that that's part of its diabolical nature, um, and I but I but I, I it also raises the question: Do you then become perpetually committed to the generic and the building type? It's a really building type driven. Um, software and it, it will it will adjudicate your project in the direction of the standard building typology again and again and if you say that that's a cost of cheapness that you're willing to pay to constantly repeat the the standard building type um, I mean that's not an argument that you would have with me but I think that that's an argument that you would have with some people mm -hmm. about whether you want to be a priori committed to the existing building types Indefinitely, I don't know. I don't know how. Well, I think Itoshi wants. To. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's fine. Okay, so.